Well, first of all, I want to thank you for coming back. <laughs> That's always an encouragement. And somebody said to me, Utley, your teaching style is the donkey and the two-by-four approach. I, that's true. But I, I want to say this to you, and I, I needed to probably say it this morning. I, I'm really not here to get you to agree with me. That's not my, ever my goal. But I do want to challenge you to think through what you already believe and why you believe it. So I really want to challenge you on, people say to me, well, I never heard that before. Well, so, <laughs> I mean, that, that's not good or bad. So if I really want to cause you to think, that's what I'm saying. I, I really don't want to, I really don't, not looking for your agreement, but I am looking for you to let me challenge you. Now, I've been praying about this. I know you've been praying about this. Uh, we want the Spirit to be here, amen? We want Him to challenge us and speak to us and encourage us. So I hope, I hope that I can do that. Now, I need to go back and do a couple of cleanup this morning. It, it's just difficult to do my kind of teaching on a, in a sermon format because it kind of gets away. And I, I was trying to look at my Bible. I've written so many notes, I couldn't read my, the Bible text. And that's always embarrassing. So if you, have, if you have your notes, and I'm going to look at those and use those some, I want to go to the contextual insights to Ephesians 1. So that's, you see chapter 1, and just quickly let me explain to you what I'm doing here in chapter 1. I am trying to, because I said to you this morning that the smallest unit you should ever try to interpret is a paragraph, that words only have meaning in sentences, and sentences only have meaning in paragraphs. So if you'll notice, I have tried to put together the paragraph divisions with their capsulization from these different, now several of them are English. The one on the far left, this is the latest United Bible Society's Greek New Testament, fourth edition. The other ones are word for word, so you got a Greek word, you have to have an English word. That's one theory in translation. And then on the far right are what we call dynamic equivalent. I did want to use NIV, but the National Council of Churches told me you can use it for $3,000 volume. So when they get saved, I'll use it. Until then, I'm going to use today's English version out of the United Bible Societies and the Jerusalem Bible, which is a wonderful, really good uh, uh, Catholic French translation. Now, if you can see across this, in this first chapter, it looks kind of uniform. If I was a preacher or a teacher, this is what I'd say to myself as I compared these translations and how they paragraph, because paragraphing is not something you can see from the text itself. If I present chapter 1, here's my question as a preacher or teacher. How many main points are there? And these main points ought to follow the paragraphing. So it kind of gives us a broad picture on how to see this chapter. Now, you also notice in your notes a thing called contextual insights. So what I try to do is give you the major truths of the whole chapter looking from a bird's eye view before we get into the nitty gritty of this word and this verb and on and on. So this is where I want to come back to for two opening statements that I did not get a chance to do this morning. The concept of the Trinity is mentioned more in Ephesians than anywhere else. Now the word Trinity comes from Tertullian. The word Trinity never appears in the Bible. But over and over in unified context, these three persons appear, whether at the baptism of Jesus or the one that I think is clearest to me is the Great Commission baptismal formula. Baptize them in the name singular of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is bad grammar, but great theology. Now, the church has struggled with this. And why? Well, we do not believe in three gods. We are monotheist. We go back to the Old Testament, particularly Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. We believe in one and only one God. We are not polytheist. 
Well, what do we do if Jesus really is divine? John 1, Colossians 1, Philippians 2, Hebrews 1. What do we do? Is he really divine? Is he really preexistent? What do I do with one God and now I've got the Father and I've got the Son? And in the Old Testament, the Spirit is an influence that goes out to accomplish God's will. In the New Testament, he is a full-blown person. So, the early church was in a quandary. So, the councils, primarily of Nicaea, but Constantinople before that, came up with this statement. We believe in one eternal divine essence and three eternal personal manifestations. And that is the best that we can do. No New Testament author thought it was so contradictory they ever took time to explain it. So we accept it without fully understanding it. That's the best we can do with this concept of the Trinity. So I've given you some notes there and where it appears. Again, most of my detailed studies, and if you are the type that want to check all the verses and look at all the places, you have to see these notes online, and this will be the second red box, special topics, and look up the word Trinity, because it appears often, and I'm on, there are some places in the Old Testament where the plurality of God is very, very obvious. Even in the Old Testament, there is a plurality, and I want to show you those verses as well as the new. Now, the second one is number C, and there is so much controversy here, and I do not want to get into a hair pull, really. Well, I guess I do, or I wouldn't bring it up, but I want to be as nice as I can in the hair pull. And I want to say to you, this is a fight inside the church. This is believers discussing with believers. Amen? This, this is not false teachers. This is not bad versus good. This is godly people have seen these texts differently, and how they see it makes sense to large numbers of other Christians. But I think what we forget is that this tension between a sovereign God and human free will goes all the way back to Paul. And I'll try to show that to you. Theologically, this hair pull begins with Augustine and Pelagius. And then later on the Reformation, it gets carried on into Calvin and Arminius. Now this is where, the, where we are. I basically am Arminian in my understanding of truth. And I'm somewhat surprised that such a large percentage of graduating Baptist pastors are full five-point Calvinist. That surprises me some. Because historically, we have been people of evangelism. We have emphasized a personal decision in trusting Christ. Now that is somewhat somewhat out of place in the five points for Calvinism. So I am struggling as a teacher. I am struggling as a person who believes the Bible. I don't think it's fair to add up all the verses on one side here and all the verses on one side here and see which one has the most verse. I do not think that's appropriate Bible study. So I'm going to read my note, I hope it doesn't offend you, on this introductory article, when I get to he chose us in verse 4, I want to read my article. And when I get to the word predestination in 5, I want to read my article. Now, what am I doing? Do I want you to convince you that I'm right? Absolutely not. What I want to convince you is that godly people, based on church history and Scripture, see these texts differently. Therefore, we've got to love and pray for each other and pray that God uses these different groups to reach different personality types. So do you hear where I'm coming from? Election is a wonderful doctrine. However, it is not a call to favoritism, but a call to be a channel, a tool, a means of others' redemption. In the Old Testament, the term was used primarily for service. I hope you'll check me for that. In the Old Testament, election or chosen is always for service, never for any kind of a spiritual event. In the New Testament, it's used primarily for salvation, which issues in service. The Bible never reconciles the seeming contradiction between this God's sovereignty and mankind's free will. 
but affirms them both. A good example of the biblical tension is found in Romans 9. Now, you are Bible people. Romans 9 is the strongest chapter on predestination in the Bible. Romans 10 has more whosoever wills than any other chapter in the Bible. Side by side, in a discussion about why has Israel not believed, Paul asserts the sovereignty of God, and in the next chapter, three times, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you hear the tension in that? The key to this theological tension may be found in Ephesians 1, 4. Jesus is God's elect man, and all are potentially elect in him. Now, that's a statement from Karl Barth. I certainly don't agree with all that Karl Barth said, but I certainly agree with that statement. Jesus is God's yes to fallen mankind's need. Ephesians 1, 4 also helps us clarify the issue by asserting that the goal of predestination is not heaven, but holiness. Think what I just said. We are often attracted to the benefits of the gospel and ignore the responsibilities. God's call, election, is for time as well as eternity. Doctrines come in tension-filled pairs with other truths, not as a single unrelated truth. A good analogy would be a constellation. If, if you look at the Big Dipper, you can't say, I like the second star in the handle. It's only the Big Dipper because these stars are related to each other in a pattern. Every doctrine is a constellation of truth. And if you pull the string on one doctrine, you damage a lot of other doctrines. It must be seen as a totality, not as an individual focus. And we're so guilty of proof texting, we do not see that. Doctrines come in tension field pairs because it's from Eastern people. And that's so difficult for us to come to. Um, let me go a little further. We must not remove the tension caused by the dialectical, paradoxical pairs of doctrinal truth. Examples, God as transcendent versus God as imminent. Is God the holy other? To see him is to die. Or is God Abba Father? We can go and talk to him. Do you believe in once saved, always saved? I know who I'm talking to. Or do you see the mandate of perseverance in the Scripture? Perseverance is as biblical a doctrine, is pitted as often as Christian assurance. And because of our background, we totally ignore perseverance. When I go to a church and say, I'm uncomfortable, once saved, always saved, I almost feel like I've dropped a theological hand grenade in the midst of unthinking Baptists. I'm over it. <laughs> the theological tension of covenant unites the sovereignty of God who always takes the initiative, who always sets the agenda, and the mandatory initial and continuing repentant faith response from an individual. Be careful of proof texting one side of the paradox and depreciating the other. Be careful of advocating only your favorite doctrine or system of theology. I hope that's a good warning, and I hope that for me, being Arminian, emphasizing that free will is absolutely crucial for the beginning of the covenant and the continuing, I cling to what? John 1, 12. As many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him. I don't know if I'm elect, but thank God I'm a part of whosoever. You say, don't be emotional. Well, you fight with these other preachers. <laughs> a couple of more points I wanted to pick up on, not a whole lot, but some. Would you look at chapter 1, verse 1? The word saints. Now, the word saints is basically a Greek, from the word holy, in Roman Catholicism, you know, there's a big fight over how many miracles you have to do and how many councils you have to go to to call somebody a saint. I want you to know that's not biblical at all. 
And I don't want to pick on Roman Catholics because the truth is, if you tell me you love Jesus and you're trusting in him, you're my brother and sister and I don't care what name is on the outside of the church. But when it comes to saint, we are a saint because the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been imputed to our account. We're righteous, we're holy, we're a saint because we're in him. Now the Bible also says, because you're holy, because you're a saint, now live it out. This is when the great um, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 48, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Now, the topic, if you want to see more of that, is the special topic, sanctification. You can see it online where I try to give you the verses. We're positionally holy, and we need to possess our position or the demand for Christ's likeness. And people always, which one's true? Will you get over A or B and recognize that the Bible is A and B? And the only way you get A or B is to ignore some text in the Bible. And I say it this morning, I want to say it again. You do not have the right as a Christian to let one inspired text dominate or depreciate another inspired text. You don't get to choose which inspired text you like. We have to try to bring something together. And that's what covenant does for me in this area. Now, if you look down a few verses, uh, well, a few items in your notes, I come to who are faithful. Now, very quickly, and I'm, I want to make a point on this. I feel like most Christians just, they get an English dictionary and they say, this is what it means. This isn't, this isn't English. Now, the way to go to find out word meaning in the New Testament is not to go to a Greek lexicon because they're based on Greek poets, Greek governmental documents of the Mediterranean world. The place you go to find the meaning is the Koine Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, done about, no, no scholar really knows, but 150 years B.C., something like it. This was the Bible of the synagogue outside of Palestine until Christianity came and they got so nervous about its affirmations, they had to get a new translation for the synagogue. So what we have here, this is, the, this is the Hebrew word that means a stable stance. It's the word emeth. Now, you know this word because the word amen is a form of this. It means something that's settled and sure and not easily knocked over. So like all words, it starts with something concrete and it moves toward a metaphorical extension. So it came to be mean loyalty, trustworthiness, faithfulness. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that you're right with God because of your loyalty, your trustworthiness, and your faithfulness? Well, I hope you don't. We faith his faithfulness. We trust his trustworthiness. It's what I was saying this morning. When I stand before God and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? The answer is you. You said, you promised, you sent, you died, you opened the tomb. It's who he is, and we're putting everything in who he is, everything. Now, I want to go down to, uh, forgive me for skipping through here. I, I, I left some things out this morning I wanted to pick up on. Would you go to chapter 1, verse 4, this word, he chose us. Again, this is the ideal of election. This was John Calvin's favorite chapter. And I, I think, I certainly believe in the sovereignty of God. Please put me down in the, in the category of those who believe that God's going to do what God wants to do. Thank you. Isn't that what Romans 9 is? I'm the potter. You're the clay. Sit down and shut up. That's God. That's who he is. But, <laughs> look at, he chose us. This is Eris Middle. That means that subject of the sentence is actively participating in the action of the verb. This is a, a completed action, meaning he once and for all himself chose us. Amen. It's God's deal. God the Father's deal, which emphasizes the subject's decisive choice. This focuses on the Father's choice before time. God's choice must not be understood in the Islamic sense of determinism, 
nor in the ultra-Calvinistic sense of God chooses some versus God did not choose others. But in the covenantal sense, God promised to redeem fallen mankind. He called and chose Adam to choose all humans. But look at all those texts I gave you. If you don't agree with what I said, would you at least check the biblical references? God himself elected all persons. The believer's choice of trusting in Christ confirms, not determines. God's choice of them. God always takes the initiative in salvation. The text, Romans 8, 28, 29, 30, Romans 9, 1 through 33, are the main New Testament texts for the doctrine of predestination, emphasized by Calvin, and, uh, excuse me, Augustine and Calvin. God chose believers not only to salvation, but also to sanctification. This could relate to our position in Christ, imputed righteousness, God's desire to reproduce his character in his children, Christ's likeness. God's will for his children is both heaven one day and Christ's likeness now. The pronouns in this passage are ambiguous. Most refer to God the Father. This whole passage speaks of his love, purpose, and plan to redeem fallen mankind. However, in context, it is obvious that the pronouns in verse 7, 9, 13, and 14 refer to Jesus. <clears throat> I hope you do not sense that, it, that I'm trying to crawdad on this problem. But I am trying to bring a needed biblical theological balance. I want to affirm all text. Now, I pastored in Lubbock. It's flat, takes water three and a half years to run off the plateau. Every highway has a ditch. Every highway has two barbed wire fences. Now, think what I'm saying. Please think what I'm saying. The Bible presents truth on the barbed wire fences. The goal is not getting hung up in the barbed wire fences or getting in the left ditch or the right ditch. They're both a disaster. The barbed wire fences and the ditches are meant to keep you where? On the road. And we live in the tension. We live in the tension. And I'm going to mention some of those tensions we live in in just a moment. But I, I hope that was a, a thoughtful word. Now, at chapter 1, verse 5, this is my note on predestination where I give you some of these paradoxes. So, uh, kind of fall with me. I think I've already discussed most of this. You can read it, but I want to go down to the listing there. Denominations have tended to remove bi the biblical tension by emphasizing only one of the dialectical truths. Example, and in class when I do this, I say to the students, I'm going to make a series of statements that I'm going to ask you, do you believe the Bible teaches. That's the question. Do you the, believe the Bible teaches predestination? Answer's got to be yes, right? Does the Bible teach human free will? It's not an either or, it's a both and. But see, you're Western thinkers. And to you, it's got to be A or B. But to the Eastern mind, it's A and B. Let me give you a few more. Do you believe in the security of the believer or perseverance? I've already hammered that nail. Do you believe in original sin? Are you going to be condemned on judgment day because of what Adam and Eve did? Or are you going to be condemned for what you did? Is our problem original sin or volitional sin? Do you believe in sinning less? Now, I want to tell you, that's the Baptist view. We believe the more closer to Christ, the less you sin. Have you read Romans 6 lately? Jesus pulled the power supply of the sin nature. You sin because you want to, not because you have to. So do you believe in sinning less or sinlessness? So the potential is there for sinlessness. You say, I don't like it. Read Romans 6. Now, if you say you don't like Romans 6, we have a problem. Do you believe in instantaneous declared sanctification? You're holy, you're a saint, or do you believe in progressive sanctification? Be holy. Do you believe in Christian freedom, or do you believe in Christian responsibility? Am I my brother's keeper? Absolutely. The best way I know how to do this, we live in a legalistic denomination. So does Church of Christ. There's a set of rules that we think you're in or you're out of the club by doing or not doing these. 
Now, some of those rules come from tradition and not from Scripture. I don't know how hard to hit you, really. I guess I'm going home, so. (laughs) All of my life, I've grown up in a church that says total abstinence is the will of God for every sincere believer. I thought, total abstinence. What do I do with Psalm 104 that says wine is a gift from God? What do I do with Ecclesiastes that says give wine to those who are heavy laden? What do I do with Jesus turning 80 gallons of water into wine? What do I do with the Lord's Supper itself? I'm going to throw Jesus under the bus for a Baptist tradition? But, and it's a big but, does this give me the chance to get rousing drunk the bible rails against drunkenness rails against it but we've confused the railing against the item people say that's demon rum the demon is not in the rum it's in you friend do you know in rome i'm taking this from romans 14 1 through 15 13 several times paul says all things are clean baptist just threw up all things are clean but not all things edify So if I know that something I'm doing is hurting a weaker brother or a new Christian, as a mature Christian, I'm not going to do it around them. But does that mean that I'm going to limit my life to every burnt over legalist in a Baptist church? My wife, I'm glad she's not here. She always kills me when I say this. When we go on our, we go on a cruise for our crusades and we're going to have a glass of wine in the hot tub. And if you don't lick that, get out of my bathroom. Now, I would never do that publicly. Never. I used to always want to go as a professor from Marshall over to the boats in Shreveport to see some of the acts they have. But I said to myself, I can't do it. Somebody will see me there and not understand. I choose to limit my freedoms for the cause of Christ, but you can't put those rules on me, fool. You just can't do it because I know the Bible. And you can't stick the Bible, all Baptists believe on me if it's nowhere in the Bible. All of this deal about this total abstinence comes from the, from the Reformation, excuse me, the, the, what is that non-alcohol movement earlier in the 1900s? Temperance movement. All of that's, they used to call Baptist pastors 40-gallon Baptists because they made their own wine in their bathtub. And then came the abuse on the frontier of alcoholism. Then came the movement politically to try to stop it and all that came with it. And we have been caught up in Western history and not in biblical truths. Now, I slapped you really hard with that. And please don't think I'm trying to convince you. But I just want to get your bony finger off me. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. Do I limit my freedom for him? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Romans 14, 1 through 13, 15, 13. Okay, let me go on. Uh, I'm trying to make some really good points. I couldn't do this morning with the type of service it was. (laughs) I didn't want people screaming and running out. Um... Let's look for a minute at the word. Um, let's go to one nine for a minute. One nine, the word mysterion or mystery. Um, what I've tried to say to you is that Paul uses that that word at least thirteen different ways, and um, it, it's very hard to lock Paul down on some of these uses. But I would say the mystery is, it's always something like the word hope. The word hope is used in a lot of different ways. It doesn't mean maybe, could be, and the word mystery is not something unknown. It's something to do with the consummation of the believer's faith. It's always used in that sense. And I think the best definition is in chapter 2, verse uh, 11 through 313, and I'll talk to you about that when I get there. Um, Uh, Notice here in verse 11 where it says, We have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose. Um, Election is according to grace and not human merit. When when I hope I get to chapter 2 tonight, 
In verses 8 and 9, which I just love, for by grace have you been saved. And notice these disclaimers for any kind of human merit. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourself, gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Where is the focus? Who God is. Why? Because of the Gnostic false teachers claiming a special knowledge and merit for humans. So everything in the doctrinal section of Ephesians is on the sovereign God's acts. But you've got to see what Ephesians is, is, is talking against to understand that. Um, <clears throat> Let's go to the next paragraph, which is 15 through 23, one long sentence. Remember I told you the false teachers emphasize secret knowledge, these passwords through the heavenly sphere, what that salvation was. Uh, this is one long sentence, and it's basically talking about, about that. Um, <clears throat> it's going to talk about wisdom and knowledge. It's going to use these. What Paul does is take the words of the false teachers, their slogans, and he uses them in a correct way in his theology. A really good one is the word fullness or filling. That's the word pleroma. And that in Greek, that means the fullness of something. They would call that, that from a holy God down to sinful matter, the series of angels, they would call it the pleroma or the fullness of God. Paul turns right around and says, Jesus is the fullness of God. Do you hear? It's exactly opposite, but using the false teacher's words. Now, in this section, we're going to have the word wisdom and knowledge. Don't you see he's saying Jesus is God's wisdom and knowledge, not these false teacher's assertions. So it's a play here. Verse uh, 17 is a good place uh, to say that. Now, if you look at the notes, I'm at verse 1, eight, uh, chapter 1, 18 and 19. Knowledge of God... And the Father's provisions in Christ involve three things. Number one, the believer's predestined hope. Number two, the believer's glorious inheritance. And number three, the believer's understanding of God's surpassing great power manifested in Christ. Now, this is going to be Paul's assertion of what these false teachers have said to the church, have torn up the church, and Paul is trying to put it back together. If you drop two, one thing down, 118, the word calling has become a problem. I hope it, sometime you will do this on your own. Get a concordance, look up the word called. Look how it's used in the New Testament. You can't believe the variety of how this word is used. I've listed some. Sinners are called by God through Christ to salvation. Sinners call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Believers are called to live Christ-like lives. Believers are called to ministry task. Do you see how you cannot define the word called except in a context? Words only have meaning in context. So you can't put a preset definition on a theological word and just start sticking it in everywhere that word used. I remember I was writing these commentaries and I finally, I usually write Paul, I preach mostly out of Paul, but I was getting into the Gospels and so I came to Matthew chapter 6 about the word righteousness without even thinking about it. I read Paul's definition of righteousness right into Matthew 6. And then I started studying and I thought, that is not at all what this means. Righteousness in Matthew 6 is the three things the Jews hope for for salvation. One of them is almsgiving. One of them is synagogue attendance. One of them is sacrifice of the feast day. Righteousness, Paul's using it in its Jewish sense. I would have totally misunderstood that part of the sermon, uh, of the um, special sermon of Jesus there in Matthew 5. In verse 19, I just want to make this comment toward us who believe. I wish I could believe in universalism. There's no joy in my heart over judgment. But there are too many verses in the Bible that talk about him who believes. Uh, belief is crucial. Repentance and belief are absolutely mandatory. Now, I'm just, this is just Bob, this hidden Bible. I worry about aborted babies. I worry about people who are not capable of thinking through these kind of things. I worry about those who've never had a chance to hear. 
There's really nothing in the Bible that covers those. There's a verse here or there that might sort of kind of obliquely refer. But this is what I've come to a piece of my own heart. Everything I know about God is he it's a gracious, loving, bend over backwards supporter of man. And in these areas I can't understand and don't know, I'm going to trust the character of a merciful, eternal God to deal with it in a fair and loving way, and I don't have to have the answer. And to me, that has brought me some peace in about some topics that I do not think the Bible directly addresses. Uh, verse 20, I wish you'd look there with me. Uh, chapter 1, verse 20, because when I get to chapter 2... <laughs> Um, I'm going to make a comparison between chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, in chapter 1, verse 20. In chapter 1, verse 20, is what God the Father did to the Son. In chapter 2, 5 and 6, is what God the Son did to the believers, and they're parallel. So notice here these three things, they're the three things set in a parallel pattern here. Number one, he raised him from the dead. Number two, he seated him in his right hand. And number three, he made him supreme head of the church. Now, if you will look at chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, number 3 doesn't apply, but numbers 1 and 2 does. It's not one day we'll be seated with him. We're seated with him now. These are current realities. We are already a raised people. A physical resurrection at the second coming we're already the people of God. We already participate in the promises of eternal life. Now, the Jews believed in two ages, an evil age beginning in Genesis 3 and going through the coming of the Messiah, evil, unrighteousness, rebellion, idolatry. But God is going to send his Messiah and set up an age of righteousness, the age of the Spirit, the new age. The problem is the Jews missed the two comings of Christ. And what we have is the overlapping of those two Jewish ages. And when the Bible calls the latter days or the end times, that is between the incarnation at Bethlehem and the parousia or the second coming. Um, Garden Fee calls this the already and the not yet of the Christian life. I already have eternal life, but my body is dying. I already have power over sin and forgiveness, but I still am tempted with sin. This is the kind of tension we live in. But I'm just shouting this. Oh, I'm shouting this. Brothers and sisters, the victory of the Christian faith comes not at the second coming. It came at the first coming. 95% of the Old Testament prophecies are about the first coming. Victory is won on Calvary and the empty tomb. We walk in victory because of who he is. And the second coming is just the cleaning up of the mess. And I really think God is waiting that the church will have more time to help people come to know him because he loves all of them. I don't pray for the second coming anymore. Because it'll be good for me, but bad for the vast majority of the world. God, give us a little more time to be the people of God. Because I think God's heart beats for a lost world. And he has sent us and left us to tell them about him. Verse 21, do you see that this is, now if you, the special topic there, Paul's use, well, Paul, um, angelic levels in Paul's writings. Paul uses a lot of these terms. We have no idea what these terms are. The Bible is so silent on both the angelic realm and the demonic realm. The Bible is so silent, silent about the afterlife, probably because we don't have vocabulary or ability to understand it. But Paul lists, just think of Ephesians 6, all those different categories, principalities and powers and world forces of wickedness and all of that. That's what the, he's referring to these eons they're claiming the knowledge of these eons is the key. And Jesus says, he's defeated all of them. They are all in the garbage bin. He triumphs over them. He let me do a parallel passage. Oh, it's so powerful when you see it in context. Um, verse, uh, verse 22, just for a minute. You do realize that God's going to put everything under Jesus' feet and then Jesus is going to give it back to the Father, right? My little joke is, we, the Episcopals talk about the Father, the Baptists talk about Jesus, and the Charismatic talk about the Spirit. we got to get him back together. <laughs> this, is, this is one God. The trick is, when all is said and done, 
It's God the Father on the throne. And the text is right here, 1 Corinthians 15, 27 and 28. Jesus will give all this back to the Father. I think we need to remember that. I want to talk about just the church and that same verse just for a minute. This is the word ekklesia. It's two words, ek, out of, and kaleo, to call. Now, it can be used for a town hall meeting as it is in Acts. But I think the church picked this word because in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that famous phrase, the assembly of Israel, the congregation of Israel, is the Hebrew word kahal, assembly, congregation. When those translators, Jews in a B.C. period, wanted to find a Greek word to use to describe the congregation of Israel, they picked ecclesia. I believe these, these believers these in the upper room and, and those who believed in Acts, they do not see themselves as an offshoot of Judaism. They see themselves as the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament promises. They are the people of God. They are the new Israel. They are not some secondary plan B, but God's plan. Now, I've just hit a theological topic depending on what theological system you have bought into and read. And I'm not going any further because I really want to stay another couple of days. Let's get to chapter 2. I think um, you told me I could go a little bit past 7.30, right? Is it... Uh, okay, good. Let's do chapter 2 then. Um, I want to go to B under contextual insights. There are only two places in the Bible where the three enemies of man are delineated with any specificity. This one is the major one, and James 4 is the other. So what are the three enemies of man? Do you see them spelled out here? A fallen world system, an angelic adversary, a person, Satan, and the fallenness, the Adamic nature of man that pulls everything towards self. So Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, is the hopelessness and helplessness of man apart from God. And as an evangelist, and I know Pat has this same heart, Pat, when I read Ephesians 2, 1, and Paul looks out over the great cities of the Mediterranean world and Paul says they are dead in their trespasses and sin. And I look out over the streets of Houston or Dallas or New York or Constantinople and the world doesn't know him. And we ought to be praying for them and for us. And we all have a heart. Thank God somebody told us about Jesus. Amen? Mother, friend, co-worker, the world is dead without Christ. That motivates me. I, I don't want them to agree with me, but I want them to find the peace and joy and purpose and fulfillment that I have found at faith in Christ. Now, when it says you were dead in your trespasses and sin, I want to pick up on the word dead again. And again, this is where a concordance, you look at the word dead, this word is used several different ways. You've got to see where it is. Remember, it starts out in Genesis 3. The day you eat of the fruit, you will what? Die. Let me ask you a question. Adam, you know, Eve ate. I want to be romantic and say Adam ate just to stay with her. I think that's baloney, but it's Valentine-ish. Um, they both ate. Did they die? Their relationship with God is damaged. Their relationship with each other is damaged. Their relationship with the world is damaged. We call that spiritual death. Something happened to the mind and heart of man. He didn't die. He will. And God pushed him out of the garden lest he eat of the tree of life and stay in that terrible condition. So the first one is spiritual death. Uh, the second one, and this is the idea of just physical death. You go to Genesis 5. How many people have tried to read the Bible and got to Genesis 5? Everybody's dead, and you can't pronounce their names. And they go, forget that. <laughs> yeah, there's one in there that's not, Enoch. Thank God for Enoch. Everybody else is dead. If spiritual death is not dealt with before physical death, then occurs the third death. 
which is called the second death in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 20, called the lake of fire. There are eternal consequences to unbelief. And so these are the three uses of death. So we have to see where it is in the Bible. Um, okay, let's get into the text itself. There's some really exciting things here. Um, the word trespasses and sins, do you realize that the word righteousness is it comes from in Hebrew when God was saying what can I use to describe myself to these people how can I lower the shelf to say everybody can understand what I'm talking about he picked a construction metaphor to describe himself now they used a plumb line to for the straightness of a wall they used a river reed, R-E-E-D, for the horizontal straightness. We would call it a bamboo pole in our culture. These are very straight, 20 plus feet long. He picked that construction metaphor to say, I am this. So when we say, I'm not as bad as old so-and-so, the problem is old so-and-so isn't the standard. Every word for sin in Hebrew and Greek means something of a deviation from the standard. And this is why Paul can say the summary, Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of a glory or standard of God. God himself is the one who we choose by. And that's why this word is so crucial. Now, the word walked, this is biblical imagery for the Christian life. When I get to chapter 4, walk worthy of the calling. Do not walk as the Gentiles walk. On and on. Four uses of the word walk as referring to the Christian life. If it's not talking about Jesus walked from Jericho to Jerusalem or something literal, it's metaphorical for the Christian life. Um, according to the course of this world or this age, this is the ideal of a fallen human. It just amazes me. We're just bombarded with a fallen world advertisement. Now, this is my joke. It's years old, but I still like it. <laughs> I remember this woman. She's on TV, young woman. She's in Colorado. She's walking by a creek. The aspens are quaking. Should have been happy. Colorado on a creek and the aspens. Should have been happy, but she's sad. She's all alone. Huh. So she takes out of her purse and puts on $500 an ounce perfume. Suddenly, off the top of the hill, comes a half-naked man on a white horse. Picks up this girl they live. You've got to be a fool to buy $500 perfume. If you're a jerk, you're a jerk that smells good. If I buy the right car, I can get a date. If I get the right job, I can get a date. If I wear sharp clothes, I can get a date. No, if you're a jerk, you're a jerk. What, is that? what are they trying to say to us? If you have more, you'll be better. How many people have more you know that aren't better? This world cannot fit the whole of lostness in mankind. This is uh, Augustine's God-shaped hole in every man. And you can put money and power and sex and drugs and fame in that hole and nothing satisfies. You find Jesus and everything else has its appropriate place in life. Things aren't bad. The priority of things are bad. And we're sold this bill of goods over and over. I mean, my son in junior high, years ago, y'all laugh at me. We used to give our kids an allowance to buy clothes. So my son came and said, Dad... I need to have some Jibo blue jeans. I said, son, Wranglers are $14.95 at Kmart. He said, dad, if I don't have these blue jeans, I won't be accepted by my friends. Those blue jeans cost $60. I helped him buy that. Then the zipper broke. I said, darn, you think for $60, they'd put a good zipper in the thing. You th was he going to be happy? Our kids kill each other today over sports memorabilia clothing. What if we let happen to us? Materialism. Things. More and more for me at any cost. This is the world we live in. Now, the second one is Satan, and I want to talk about him for a minute. And I want to kind of pick up on something. I hope you'll think with me. I know there's many of you are preachers here and uh, been trained in school and seminaries. I've often wondered about the rapture passage of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. We're going to get caught up in the air with the Lord. And I've often wondered, what is that all about? This is just my theory based on this text, where Satan is called the prince and the power of the air. Now, the ancient world believed that the atmosphere above the earth, which they called the ether, was the realm of the demonic. I think we're going to meet Jesus in the middle of Satan's kingdom to show its total overthrow. 
the prince and the power of the air. I've listed here in my notes some of the things that the New Testament calls this personal force of evil. The ruler of this world, John, the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The prince and the power of the air here in Ephesians. Uh, He who is in the world, 1 John 4, 4. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, 1 John 5. I believe in a personal force of evil. I do not believe we're going to be able to stand before God and say the devil made me do it. Flip Wilson. I believe he can tempt, but he cannot force us to act. I just share this as a personal testimony. There's not a whole lot I'm afraid of, but I am a little nervous about the demonic. It has not been part of my ministry, and I'm afraid I'm really glad. (laughs) One lady called me one time in Lubbock, middle of the night, and said, I'm in the middle of an exorcism. Do you know any Latin? Please. My youth director said, you should have told her, e pluris unum. (laughs) But at night, in my dreams, in my subconscious, when evil comes, and I am afraid, one little word shall fail him. Amen, Luther. And I can speak the name of Jesus, and I can get peace and power over anything in the world. Now, I live at Caddo Lake. And they they movie out there called The Creature from the Black Lagoon. If you saw that, you're a strange person. <laughs> but anyway. And you know, the, the, the deal is, if you stay in the bed under the cover, they can't get you. But if you got to go to the bathroom, you are dead meat. So all the way to the bathroom, I worry about what's in the bathtub. And so as I go, I quote, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you're afraid of, but I want you to know Jesus has conquered it. I want you to know he's with you and for you, and there is no name under heaven more powerful than his name. And we are in him, and we walk in him, and he lives and moves in our lives. Do not fear, believer. We're in a frightening world. We can't control the circumstances, but we know someone who can and will and does, and he likes us. He really likes us. Now, the lust of the flesh, this is talking about the Adamic nature, the propensity of every one of us towards sin and self and more and more for me. And what bothers me, even as a Christian, I struggle with some of this. I'm not sure I ever had a pure motive about anything. This ego always pops its head in and embarrasses me. I have to pray about it. Lord, why? I think the reason that God allows some of this temptation to continue in our lives let me get the illustration when I was young I used to cuss so bad that my friends would not even bring their girlfriends around me and I thought you're calling me to preach I'm gonna scald some church someday really bad God really really delivered me from that I mean really completely but other things I struggle with he didn't deliver me from and I got this picture Bob I'm holding on to the coattail of your coat and anything that will destroy you I'm going to protect you from But, Bob, I'm going to let you face some of the things in the world so you'll realize you never come to some kind of spiritual plateau and you'll recognize you always need me. And he's left some of those things in my life that I have to continue to struggle with. But thank God he gives the victory through Christ. Amen? Isn't the most stupid imagery in the Bible is conquering sheep? (laughs) You're a conquering sheep, dude. Conquering sheep. Verse 4, would you let me look at this minute with you? This is against the hopelessness and helplessness of verses 1 through 3. The the blackness of human sin. I want to tell you 4 through 7 is a yee-haw shout, call your mother to the table. Look at verse 4. But God, what a great big antithesis. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, in the midst of our need, he came to us. We didn't come to him. Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He came for us in the middle of our sin and shame. He is for us. He is with us. He's rich in mercy. Now, just a word here. If you go over to about verse 7 or so, um, this is only really spoken of, I think, three times in the Bible. And I have kind of forgotten the verses. One of them is in chapter 3. If you look at the margin of your Bible, you'll see the parallel listed in the, in the notes. Christians are on display 
to the angelic world about the character of God so they can trust more in him. When the angels see what God has done, even giving his son, even giving his law, even giving his presence to sinful man, angels take note and rejoice. This text, the one in chapter 3, and I believe it's 1 Corinthians 4, 7, or 8 are the only three verses. We are trophies of the grace of God on the shelf for the spiritual realm to see who God is as he works with us. Oh, it's powerful and, and, and moving. Now, verse 5 and, and 8. This is that famous, um, by grace you have been saved. Now, would you please look at the grammatical feature. This is a perfect passive paraphrastic participle. And what does that mean? We are saved by an outside agent. The perfect means we're saved in the past and it comes into a state of being. And the paraphrastic is a settled condition. We have been and continue to be saved. It's repeated in verse 5 and 8 for emphasis. So I want to say this to Baptists. If I ask you the question, are we saved? Are we being saved? Or shall we be saved? Which one is biblical? And the answer is yes. But see, if we focus on one and not the other, we get imbalanced. And some denominations folk on the settled position, some focus on the tenuousness of the ongoing, and some put everything at the end. All, verb, all Greek verb tenses describe salvation. We are being saved, and we will not be fully saved until we see him as he is and are changed into his likeness, 1 John 3, 2. So... I think we need to think about the way we talk about being saved. And what that basically means, I cannot say I was so excited when I was in kindergarten at vacation Bible school. I cried. I was so happy. I trusted Christ. But the rest of my life has been a total disaster of unbelief and waywardness and lack of any kind of God in my life. Can I depend on that? I cannot. Because how we live is not the basis of our salvation, but the evidence that we have been saved. You see, that goes against the grain for us. Because we've always said, only believe, only believe. The heretics of the early church accused the Christians of saying that. But the Christians never said that. Because salvation is more than the affirmation of a creed. It's the entering into a personal, dynamic, ongoing relationship. I've heard that all my life. People say, you've got to have a personal relationship. Well, I've never seen Jesus. I've never heard Jesus. Some have, and I wouldn't doubt that, but I haven't. So how do I say I have a personal relationship? You think my Bible floats and verses turn red? No. But when I'm lonely and hurting and confused and don't know what to do, and I call out to him and believe he's with me and for me and will give me the direction I need, that's a sign of a personal relationship. Have you talked to him today? And not about now I lay me down to sleep and not about thank you for the food. Do you know him? Do you talk to him? Notice it says, verse 6, raised with him. We're not going to be raised. We have been raised. <laughs> Yeehaw. This is Eris, friends. This is completed action. And we're seated with him. What does that mean? I always get people to say, well, I'm going to reign with Christ. Do you have any clue what that means? Who are you going to reign over? The lost people are gone. Who are you going to reign over? Are all of us going to reign? Jesus told the apostles, you'll reign. Paul says, we're going to reign. It's just a way of saying we're with Christ and his power. Don't be thinking about, I get a golden wand too. No, you don't. I get to sit on the golden throne. By the way, do you really think God has a golden throne? Do you think the spiritual creator present throughout the universe would dare to can someone without a body sit on a golden throne and what does gold mean anyway this is imagery of value to humans but heaven is far more than that streets of gold who cares who cares if Jesus lives at motel six I want to go to motel six well they got roaches maybe motel eight I don't know 
So what is the key here? Through faith. What what are the requirements of the New Testament? Faith. Repentance and faith. Okay, that's about as far as I can get because I want to give you a chance to talk to me. Please, my personality is, I don't know what it is. But anyway, I... I'm not going to bite you. I don't want you to bite me. I don't think I have all the answers. I'm so willing to listen to you. So don't take my passion as dogmatism. It's not. Uh, So let me be me and I'll let you be you. And if you have a question, please ask me. Any new thought that you heard tonight that you'd like to... uh, Think about and pray about. And yes, I think Israel was called to be God's revelation to the nations. So the word elect means called to service, right? And of course, the problem is we call Israel the covenant people, but the vast majority of her kings and people were idolatrous unbelievers. So being a part of the covenant people was never the key. It was trusting God in the midst of the covenant, right? So I think Israel is an indispensable leak in the revelation of God to mankind. But I believe since uh, Matthew 5, 17 through 19, that affirms the Old Testament, says it's of God, says it's expired, and then it says it's fulfilled. And then, by the way, real quickly, as an Old Testament professor, we couldn't get people to take Old Testament. They all wanted to take New Testament. <laughs> So I would say to them, the only Bible Jesus had and the apostles was the Old Testament. In Matthew 5, 7 through 19, when Jesus affirms the Old Testament with tremendous words of eternality and and inspiration, if you'll notice in verses 21 through 48, following that, by the way, verse 20 is, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. They all quit breathing, verse 20. And then Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. Friends, Jesus is Lord of Scripture. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. One of those things, some of them are rabbinical misinterpretations, but one of them is the Deuteronomy 24 divorce from the law of Moses. And Jesus said he only did that because y'all were so unbelieving. Jesus changed the law of Moses. You think Jews had a conniption fit over that? And what Jesus is saying is, I am the ultimate revelation of God. Either that's true or we're in big trouble. So Israel had a meaningful place, but a place, in my opinion, that's past. So when people ask me, are you expecting Israel in the millennium? (laughs) This is tacky Bob. The New Testament is not about Israel. The New Testament is about Jesus. Now, I hope that God has mercy on Israel. Yes, and the Zechariah 12, 10 about Israel believing. Don't you believe that in Acts, when 3,000 believed on Pentecost and 5,000 believed in chapter 5, that that's part of the fulfillment of Zechariah 12? And you, because you've been oriented toward a future understanding of all these texts, expect all these things in the far future when many of them have already been fulfilled. 